Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Thank you, Andrew. And welcome to Christ Fellowship Eastside, where it's a joy to be with you this morning. So I was away last week. My family and I, we were on vacation, so it's a joy to be back. It's great to come back to all of your faces. It's exciting to worship Jesus this morning. So welcome to, to our church where we exist to multiply disciples to the glory of God. And the way we do that, we pursue Christ together. We live connected and we share good news. So um, at the end of the service, we'll have some things. Uh, I know Brent's going to talk about some of the things we have coming up, but we're excited about what God's doing at Christ Fellowship Eastside. And this morning, we want to make much of Jesus together. And so as we do that, let's pray together and let's sing some songs of praise and worship to him as we go. So join me in prayer this morning. Lord God, we're thankful for a time to gather, uh, to come together as your church. Lord, to sing praise and worship to you, to make much of your name. And God, you've called us to yourself to take your name to the nations. And God, as we are together this morning, let's make much of you. And as we leave this place today, Lord, I pray that you would change us, that we would apply the words that we receive this morning, that we would go out and make much of you. Lord, so often as we leave this place, we always say the gospel goes with you. And so, God, um, we want to make much of that. And we want to tell the nation about who you are and what you've done for them. So, God, we love you. We're thankful you first loved us. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I invite you to stand together as we sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. There of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my soul. Submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. And with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. praise this morning, sir. So we 
Together, church. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I And thank you, church, for singing. I love that song, just a prayer from the heart. Lord, I need you every hour. I need you. It's something we have to remind ourselves of daily, even from moment to moment sometimes in this life. You know, church, I hope, um, I hope it's evident, but I want you to at least know and, and, and communicate it, that we, we try to be intentional about the things that we do as a church, especially around corporate worship, so that when you come and gather with us in this setting, we're doing things very intentionally, very biblically, very thoughtfully, and I, I hope that shows. But one of the ways that we try to do that is, is the songs and the types of words that we sing together as a church. Um, I was reading an article this week from a site called Desiring God. Um, I think the author's name on the article was John Bloom, and he just made a sort of a passing comment about churches and worship and songs, and, and he, he basically said this question, stated this question, 
does the worship of your church sound like the Psalms? And I thought, oh, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting, right? Like, does the worship that we sing, that we use, does it sound like the Psalms? Now, obviously, the Psalms are um, a collection of ancient Hebrew poetry. Um, it was used um, by God's people in the worship of God. Um, and so, but understanding that, that it might not sound like ancient Hebrew poetry, I'm not proponing that we should only sing that or, or, even, or any style for that matter, Gregorian chant or, or Renaissance Baroque or even pop or rock, like uh, style-wise set aside, but does the themes and the things that we are singing about, the things that we are articulating in worship, does it match what we find in the Psalms? Because the Psalms are, are, are this really great source of, of worship, and it's the worship of God's people written, sang uh, most often directly to him. And and it, it challenged my thoughts, obviously, as a, as a worship leader. And I think, I think it could challenge our thoughts collectively to say, you know what, as we sing, as we worship, let's find themes that are similar, uh, that, that resemble the themes that we find in the Psalms. I think the song that we just sang is a great example of this. How often do we find David or the psalm writers just pouring their hearts out and saying, God, I need you. I can't do this. This is too much. The struggle is, it is too heavy or too intense. Lord, I need you. The song that we're about to sing it's called, He Will Hold Me Fast. And, and it starts with sort of this confession of weakness. Um, uh, when I fear my faith would fail. It's not something that we often sing about, that our faith is struggling, that we're failing, right? Uh, when the tempter would prevail. There's a lot of psalms of, of, of confession, right? Of saying, I, 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 temptation is strong, I've given in to this, right? So I just encourage you as we sing this next song in particular, and then over the coming weeks and months as, as we continue to to build our repertoire as a church. Just find those themes. Connect what we're singing to the Word of God. And a great place to do that is the psalm. So I'm going to ask you to continue singing with us. He will hold me fast. I fear my faith and Christ will hold me fast when the tempter
Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I send to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. But your right hand shall hold me. together with me, church. God, we love you. We praise you. We're so thankful that no matter what we face in life, no matter what we experience, no matter where we are, your hand holds us. And so, Lord, we rest and trust in that promise. We rest and trust in your hands this morning. God, draw us to yourself. We love you, and it's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. I would invite Michael Cook, our pastoral resident, to come and share a bit of an update of what's been going on in the life of our church. Hey guys, um, really glad to be with you this morning. Brent, thank you for leading us in that. Wasn't that just a beautiful song? That he never leaves us. He holds us fast. He's there through every high, every low, and every in-between. Um, I am here to share with you this morning uh, what transpired over the weekend. Now, a lot of you saw my goofy video and were like, I'm not coming to that. I'm not going to show up. And some of you did. And I'm, I'm particularly happy for some of you who did. But I'm also happy for those of you who couldn't be here who prayed for us, who supported us in what we were doing. And here's the thing. We went out and we got to give gift baskets, gift bags. I had a, a $5 gift card for Starbucks. It had some snacks in there. And we gave them out at the fire department. We got to actually talk to those guys. They showed us their trucks. I mean, they, they put the siren on for me. I, the kids got a hat. I was going to ask for one, but I decided not to at the last minute. <laughs> but uh, we had a very good conversation with them. So we have an avenue with which to do ministry right up here. Just started a relationship. And it was so easy. It was just like, here, let us give you something of a little value. Tell us how much, tell, tell you how much we love you and we appreciate everything you do in our community. We did the same thing for the folks at the nail salon. So ladies, when you go to the nail salon, go up here to Lovely Nails. Nice folks, very welcoming to us. Um, had us come in, we gave them, they were so overjoyed just that we were praying for them, we were thinking of them. Did the same thing at the QT. Mention when you go in these places of business, do business there. Um, you know, that you're from Christ Fellowship Eastside, and we're still praying for them, and we still appreciate everything they do. Did the same thing at the dollar store. Perhaps the neatest thing that took place yesterday, we're at the dollar store. We finished everything, and we're getting ready to go, and Phil says, we, sh we need to pray. And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> of course. And so we were standing there in the parking lot praying, and a lady comes out, and she says, I love what you guys are doing. I saw what you did. And I've seen you, and, and I just think, and she had on a shirt, and I think it said, For Today. And she said, I'm with For Today Ministries. She said, we witness and we, we minister to young ladies in our community that are struggling with addiction. I've struggled with addiction. And we are throwing them a big benefit in the park today, and you're invited. We'd love for you to come. We had 14 gift bags left over. We said, you know what? Take these. Let us be a blessing there, too. And so some of you are sitting there thinking, well, gee, Michael, you know, it's, it's a gift bag. I mean, who wouldn't accept free coffee, you know? But think about what that does. Think about that single mom that's dropping her kids off at the daycare. She's on her way to work. Maybe that $5 gift card doesn't mean a lot to you, but I'm going to tell you something. It means the world to her because they live in a world where there is no extra money. Some of us know how that feels. You can always be salt and light. I was reading in uh, Matthew this week and this morning again, and, and Jesus tells the disciples, he's preaching and he's teaching to everyone with the Sermon on the Mount. There's this huge crowd. He's just finished up with the Beatitudes, and he looks at him. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And then again, he tells them, you are the light of the world. A city upon a hill shall not be hidden. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. God's doing something right here with Christ Fellowship Eastside, isn't he? He's building a city on a hill. We're going out. We're being salt and light. 
So maybe you didn't cut to come yesterday. You're like, Michael, man, I just found out about it. I saw your goofy video. I was really intrigued, but I just couldn't make plans. That's okay. I got good news. We're going to do it again. We're going to continue on in these things, and we're going to do, mo- we're going to do more things, and we're going to get more uh, opportunity, and you're going to get to share your faith. And maybe you're a little bit of frightened of that. Anybody, anybody bold enough? I was. I remember being a young man watching somebody who was a mentor to me witness, and they did it as effortly as breathing. And I thought, I want to get to the point in my life spiritually where sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ comes just as naturally as breathing in and breathing out. And from that day forward, I made it my goal to make that my trajectory, that my goal, my emphasis. Now, God has called me and gifted me with the gift of evangelism. I get not everybody has that. But you know what? You can say, here, we're praying for you. We love you. So I want everybody to get in the pool. But for those of you that just want to stick your toe in and get used to the water, we got that going on for you too, okay? So please continue to pray that these gift bags make an impact. Uh, Continue to be part of it. We had a great turnout. We had a great time. We wrote them handwritten notes. Um, You can be involved in that. So look for those things to come up. We love you. I'm going to pray. I think Phil's coming to preach. Is that okay if I pray? I know Brent just prayed, but I like prayer. (laughs) Let me pray for us. Father, I just thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had um, just in this last weekend. I know several were helping um, one of our members move, and, and Lord, what a blessing that is. What a way to gather around and just share your love, God, as we benefit those who are called your children. Lord, thank you for holding us fast in this last weekend. Um, Just so many good things have happened this weekend. And then for it to culminate with with just such a special way. And as we start this new week fresh, God, may may we remember that you indeed do hold us fast. You are the giver of life, and you have delighted in us. You have given us your salvation, and there's nothing we have done to earn it. And you hold us fast, God, even when we would turn away. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunities to serve. Thank you that the fields are white with harvest. And thank you for the workers who are working in those fields. And God, we pray, send more and send us. I pray your blessing upon Phil. I pray that you would give him um, the unction on high. And God, that you would just bless his word as he preaches it. uh, Because it's not his, it's your word, God. And, uh, Lord, that it would minister to our hearts and it would change lives. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Oh, we'll, we'll try that again. Good morning. All right. We're all awake. We've got a, we've got a big crowd here this morning. This is great. Uh, summer, summer scatter is a real thing in church life where everybody's got stuff going on and travel plans and everything. So it's just it's great to, to have you all out this morning. Uh, and, and thanks, Michael, for leading the outreach event uh, on Saturday. That was, that was just a real blessing to be able to give back to our community, the community that's uh, doing so much to serve us uh, throughout the week in so many different ways that are seen and unseen, and just to, to pay attention to those folks uh, and to show them the love of Christ. Uh, it, was, it was a good opportunity for me to even be able to talk to my kids and say, well, why, why would we do that uh, for our community? And, and to be able to talk to them about the love that Christ has given to us that we can extend to others. And so that was a, that was a real blessing. And uh, Michael kind of led that well. And, and like he said, please pay attention, mark your calendars as we, we have other announcements uh, on other opportunities throughout the summer where you can jump in. It's real easy. It's not going to put you way outside your comfort zone, but maybe dial that up just a notch of like, oh, engaging with the community looks like this. Um, we are in the Gospel of Luke. So if you find the New Testament, hang a right, Matthew, Mark, then Luke chapter 13 this morning. And as you're turning there, I want you to kind of think back to this other part of our Bibles called the Old Testament. It comes before the New Testament. It it tells the story of the people of God, the people of Israel. 
that uh, had, had a lot of experiences uh, as they left Egypt, they entered this promised land, but in, in that new land, they weren't faithful to God, they disobeyed against God, they, they worshiped other gods and turned, uh, turned their backs entirely against the God who rescued them, gave them all these good things, gave them uh, a relationship with themselves, um, and so the end result was God brings punishment and they are sent into exile and sent away um, into a foreign land. And there is this moment where in the Old Testament, they're brought back into the land and they begin to rebuild and they restart what they're doing. So the, the book of Nehemiah talks about this kind of rebuilding of the walls. The book of Ezra talks about some of this rebuilding process that's taking place as they're coming back into the land. And one of the things they start to do is they begin to rebuild the temple of God. And so they're, imagine, just kind of like ants kind of scattered around building this foundation to this building, and they're beginning to reconstruct it all back together. And the book of Ezra tells us that this all happens, and at this scene where there should be a lot of rejoicing and celebration and music and dancing and all of that, uh, what you find are a bunch of old people crying. Uh, and he, he kind of zooms in on this, these old men and old women who are, who are just there weeping. And they're not weeping for joy. They're weeping because they're sad. Because that older generation remembered the old temple. And this new temple that was built, it's small. It lacks the beautiful ornamentation of Solomon's temple. It lacks all the beautiful gold and silver and all the, all the cool stuff that really made that temple something special, something that the whole world would take notice of. And most importantly, it lacked the visible presence of God right there in the temple. You can kind of feel the, just that sinking feeling in the pit of their stomach where they're, they're like, we worship the right God, right? Do we? And they're looking at these small things around them. And the book of Zechariah gives a prophecy to those people uh, in chapter 4, verse 9. You don't need to turn there, but, but he talks about the rebuilding of the temple. And then in verse 10, he says this very interesting thing. He, he says to those people who are asking this question of, is, is God still good? Does he still love us? Is he still up to the big things that he was doing on planet earth? And he, he says, who despises the day of small things? Who despises the day of small things? These small rebuildings, this small temple that is restarted again. Who despises that? And the implication is only the people who can see just the physical. Because then he goes on to talk about how God, in all his omniscience, all his omnipresence, all, all his ability to see everything and know everything on earth, looks down and rejoices, it says. Rejoices. We have a God who looks at the little things, the things that we see as insignificant, as boring, as menial in the grand scheme of things, and Zechariah says he rejoices. He claps his hands. He dances over the little tiny things that you and I say, pointless. Why is it even there? And what we're going to see is in this chapter, in this section of the, the book of Luke, how Jesus, as God in flesh and blood, rejoices over the small things. We're going to read with me Luke chapter 13. We'll start in verse 10 and go on down. It says, as he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman was there who was disabled by a spirit for over 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her, and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But the leader of the synagogue indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, there are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, hypocrites, doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated, but the whole crowd was rejoicing over the glorious things he was doing. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like, and what can I compare it to? 
It's like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the sky nested in its branches. Again, he said, what can I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like leaven that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until all of it was leavened. This is the word of the Lord. Um, In in this passage, we're going to see three things. We're going to see those who feel small, those who feel big, and the unexpected Lord overall. Those who feel small, the small woman, a big leader of the synagogue, and an unexpected Lord who reigns over all of that. Um, So we'll start with those who feel small. We see this woman in verses 10 through 13 who's, who's bent down, who's dealing with a physical condition that has lasted for 18 years. It's a, it's a condition that causes her to walk around hunched over, unable to stand upright. And Jesus makes an analogy. He says it's like a rope has been tied from her neck down to her ankles, and she can't bend up again. And she's been this way, and it's just, uh, it's absolutely a form of bondage. It's a form of slavery. It's debilitating. It's draining. And I think about the, those, those years, 18 years, 18 years. I, I think about, like, uh, I've been married to my wife, Laurel, for 14 years, right? It, it is 14, right? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> I've, I've never gotten that wrong. Um, uh, yes. Um, so... <laughs> 18 years, uh, it would be longer than that. And I think about, like, even just now, like, how so many of my memories and so many of the things that I think back on and reflect on are confined to my married life. Like, there's, there's not a lot before that that I, I, you know, have fresh memories of. Like, there are times where, where I have those flashbacks, but for the most part, like, you're thinking about kids and, and, and your house together and, and all the things that you've done together over the years. And so, you, so, so I don't really have a whole lot of memories, more than just kind of fleeting memories of before that time. And so, so we have this woman who, for 18 years, like, this is, this is all she knows for the most part. Like, maybe she has that occasional dream or that occasional thought, kind of a flashback through the day of like, ah, what, what it was like before this struck. And so with each passing day, it becomes harder and harder and harder for her to even remember what it was like to be free, to be able to walk around and look at people. So for 18 years, she's shuffled around the town, debilitated to the point where all she does is look down at the dirt and the mud and the manure in the streets as she shuffles around from place to place. I mean, as to, to engage with somebody, she would have to kind of look up to the side. And so probably she didn't really look up at a lot of people. She didn't see a lot of faces, and a lot of people didn't even see her. In a crowd, she would have just totally been lost because somebody who's hunched over, you're, you're not going to see them. You're going to see all the people who are standing up straight. And even more so, at the synagogue where Jesus finds himself at the beginning of this section. At the synagogue, um, you would have men that would get seated in the middle of the space. It was kind of like a horseshoe-shaped building. And so all the the men would kind of gather there, and there would be one man who would probably come and teach or lecture in the middle. And all the women and children would actually gather outside the building. And they would be peering in through the windows. They would try to find cracks in the, in the bricks or in the, in the roof. They would kind of thatch the roof. So, so you'd try to peek through if you could to, to see something. So, so here you have this debilitated woman pressing to try to hear the words of the Lord and trying to understand the God of the Bible and doing everything she can to, to be present for that and yet unseen, blending into the crowd. And so we find her, I think four things, ignored, totally lost in the crowd, humiliated, kind of having this posture of bowing down for 18 years. Jesus describes her as bound up, tied up by Satan, and on the outside looking in. Ignored, humiliated, bound up outside looking in. And as, I, as I thought about those ideas, I thought, man, if that doesn't describe some of us, I don't know what does. I mean, you may have come into this service or gone through this week and had those feelings, one of those feelings at some point where you, you feel like, man, I, 
I've, I've been ignored. I've been passed up on opportunities for promotion, for important roles. I, I feel just humiliated because my peers won't accept me. I feel excluded and left out. I feel because of my gender or race, I, I feel myself on the outside looking in, excluded. I feel tired and tied down due to a physical condition or a mental health diagnosis. And I, I just feel tied up. Or maybe it's, it's an it's a addiction. It's some kind of uh, sin that you're struggling with and wrestling with, and you just feel tied up by it. And Jesus says, here is, here is someone like you. Here is someone you can identify with. If you come in here hunched over, feeling insignificant, looking at your toes and dreaming of a day when you can just lift your head and be welcomed and be respected and be loved, that's what this woman felt. Speaking of respected, there's, there's another person in our story those who feel big, the big shot, Mr. Big Shot. Uh, we, we meet here in verse 14. Um, I, he, he, just, he, he just jumps right in there. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded. So he, he jumps right in, and he's, he's going he's gonna to step right into it, and Jesus is going to call him out. Jesus is going to address that. But, but at first, I, I think it's helpful for us to kind of think about this character and what it is that's driving him and why he is so different from this woman. Uh, this guy is respected. You know, they, he, he's called the leader of the synagogue. Everybody looks up to him. Uh, he, is, he is exalted in the sense that, that when, when he proclaims truth, people are going to listen. It says the crowd listens to this guy. They're, they're hanging on his every word. He is, instead of bound up by some kind of external physical condition, he seems to be free. He's walking around healthy, wealthy. He's got everything working out just fine for him. And uh, he's inside the synagogue, right there in the thick of everything. He's, he's the man who can draw the crowd. He's the, he's the special someone. As, as we look at this character, I, th I think we all know this kind of person, and in some ways, some of us maybe even are this kind of person. Uh, the, there are plenty of people who, um, you know, they're the people who know people. They're the influencers. They're the, they're the people who, um, you know, they, they get all the good promotions because they have all the good connections. They're related to somebody who knows somebody. And, and so they get, get the, the, the awesome opportunities. I think about a job experience. One of my first experiences in management where, um, you know, was, was in line for promotion, in line for a, a, a big opportunity. And instead, they, they gave me all the, the bad accounts. And then uh, some guy who was a buddy of some guy got brought in and given all the, the really easy, good uh, accounts that he had to do basically nothing. And here I am, you know, I've worked for all these years to, to earn the reputation, and, and it gets handed off to some other guy. We, we know this guy. Um, these, these are the people that get invited to all the parties, the people who are at the center of attention, at the, at the center of the crowd. These are the people who are born in the right race and gender and class so that nothing seems to be an obstacle for them. They just can go anywhere, do whatever they want. They're unhindered by any kind of physical or emotional troubles, or at least so it would seem. And so secretly we begin to wish Man, I, I wish I was like them. I wish I had their platform, their promotions, their opportunities. I, w I would love just one day to live their life. And that's what we hope for. That's what we dream of. And that's why in our culture at large, we have celebrities and thought leaders and politicians and athletes and all these people that we look to and say, I, I wish I could be like that. I wish I could be that center of attention, the, the big shot. And even Christian culture, put that in kind of broad quotation marks, um, has, has its own issues with these people who think they're big, the people who write the big books and we buy them and attend their conferences and follow them on social media, and we get sucked into the idea that bigness is equivalent to godliness, that the size of one's ministry is a sign of their closeness to God, that, 
the path to influence is found on the platforms of this life. And we get sucked into that kind of thinking. And I see this, this kind of strain, this kind of pressure of the, 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 those who think they're big, those who feel like they're big, uh, especially on, on teenagers and college students that are going out and trying to make their way into a career in life and, and trying to make something of themselves. Because it, it, it's so easy to look around yourself and see all these people who, who seem to be so successful, who are leaving their mark on your class or leaving their mark in, in the culture or, or seem to be setting themselves up for incredible success. And so you begin to look around that and say, uh, how, how am I going to stand out from the crowd? And, th- and this pressure has only been increased in the years of social media. Like, I, I can't even imagine how, how difficult it is to function in that world where, um, you know, if, if you know, in, in, when I was growing up, I only had to compete with those in my class. I only had to compete with those in my church to, to stand out from the rest. Um, and so this drive to compete and stand out from the rest has only been increased because now you're not just competing against your class or uh, those, those in your state. You're, you're competing against everybody across the entire planet. Uh, I remember watching this young guy who was uh, really doing well uh, with, with playing a musical instrument. And he was, he was uh, you know, for, for where he was at was quite good. But when he moved to a new area uh, and was surrounded by a bunch of new talent, suddenly his, his talent was basically nothing in comparison. And, and it just crushed him. And I mean, just even all the more with the pressures of being able to see, pick up on YouTube and, and watch somebody shred the guitar or something like that. It's, it's just, it's, it's a totally different game. And, and we feel that pressure of, of the big shots that are around us, and it crushes us. And so we do dangerous things to seek the attention of peers, of love interests, of influencers, of employers. But Jesus shows us a different way. And I love this. In, in the way of Jesus, the ignored... The woman who's passed over is seen. She's noticed. But what about that respected guy, the guy who's in the middle of it all? He's dishonored. Yeah, and it, at the end of um, uh, the, it, when, when it talks about um, the uh, response of the crowd, verse 17, you know, when, when he, Jesus, had said all these things, all, the, all his adversaries were humiliated and the response of the crowd follows the response of the woman. The whole crowd was rejoicing over the glorious things Jesus was doing. So, so the crowd follows after Jesus. They reject this guy who's been their leader, and they push him off. And so the, uh, the humbled woman who's been walking around, bowed down her whole life, is lifted up. And the exalted leader is bowed down in humility. He's embarrassed in front of the crowd. The, the bound woman is set free, but the seemingly free leader is shown to be bound up by the law, tied up by his own restrictions and regulations, hopeless, helpless. Jesus invites the outsider in, and the insider is pushed aside. Isn't that crazy? Jesus reveals something very different, very unexpected. And that's what we'll look at next, the unexpected Lord. I, I, I love just how Luke launches out this next section there in verse 15. He says, but the Lord answered him. The Lord. He doesn't say Jesus answered him. The, the Son of Man answered him. He says the Lord answered him. I, th- I think that choice of words is very particular because he's wanting us to zoom in on the fact that Jesus is Lord. He's master. He's, he's the, the controller of all things And he sets him out out front and says, this is the one who speaks, the one who's in charge, the one who really calls the shots. Our Lord and our Lord's work, or as as this passage will go on to describe it, God's kingdom, his work on earth, it doesn't fit within our categories. It doesn't fit within our scale of smallness to bigness. That's because God's kingdom operates with a different standard of measurement. 
know, we have an imperial uh, standard of measurement. We have metric scales. I was, uh, Josh was uh, bringing, bringing some Allen wrenches yesterday to, to, to help us move Grace's furniture. And, and we had to make sure we had the right standard uh, of, of Allen wrenches to, to unscrew the mirror off the, the dresser. Um, and, and so we operate with this expectation of standard measurements. But Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, we have a divine standard of measurement. And it's totally different than anything you've seen before, where small is big and big is small. Everything's backwards. And we've seen this time and time and time and time again throughout the gospel of Luke. And I just, this, this has been the joy for me in studying this gospel. And if, if you haven't um, grabbed one, we, we have these gospel of Luke journals that you can take in the back. They're yours. They're free. That whole table is full of free stuff. So just grab something there. And you can just go through the gospel of Luke, and it'll be, you'll be amazed at how many times you see God marks his own calendar. He values his own currency in a different way, and he makes his own measurements in a different way. His timing, his values, his estimations are just vastly different from our own. And look at how Jesus differs from the the big shot preacher. Jesus carries divine authority. Luke calls him the Lord, whereas the leader, he only carries human authority. He's been set up, propped up by the people. Jesus shows concern for the people. He, he speaks to this, uh, about this woman, and, and he calls her daughter of Abraham. When, when he says that, there, there's something beautiful in it. There, there is dignity when he says that. He's, he's, he's acknowledging that she is something special, that she is, she is an heiress to Abraham, this one who is, who is going to um, bring blessing to all the nations. She is an heiress of the tribe. But, but also, there's unity in it. Jesus, when he's saying, daughter of Abraham, who is Jesus but a son of Abraham? He, he is descended from the line of Abraham, so he's saying, I, you're, you're one with me. We're connected. And there's thirdly mercy in that statement, because mercy comes through the line of Abraham. That's what's promised in Genesis. So, so there's, there's so much beauty in that, that language when he uses that phrase, daughter of Abraham. It's supposed to resonate. It's supposed to feel like a, a warm hug around her because he has concern for her as a person, as an individual, whereas the leader only demonstrates concern for the systems and structures of synagogue and Sabbath and the way things ought to be. That's what he demonstrates concern for. Jesus then shows us a gospel of grace versus a gospel of works. The, the leader can only tell us this is the way things should be done, and Jesus offers this freedom. This, this woman never asked for it. She never begged for mercy, never begged for healing. Jesus just shows up and heals her with a miracle, with a word and a touch. Incredible. Jesus places a priority on needs versus a priority on schedule. The man is looking at his watch and saying, you got so many hours till sundown, then we can do this. Uh, And Jesus is saying, what better time than the Sabbath to set a woman free from, from Satan? This is the time. This is when it needs to be done. Jesus shows the power of God over Satan, over sickness, over sin, and this leader is completely powerless. I mean, he's been her pastor for 18 years, and he's done nothing about her situation. And Jesus steps on the scene and solves the problem. And lastly, I'm going to zoom in on this one. Jesus recognizes this as more than just a physical condition, right? You you see that um, in verse 16. He says, Satan has bound this woman the daughter of Abraham for 18 years. Satan has done this. this. This is, Jesus says, this is spiritual warfare, and you've missed it. The, the man, the leader, actually, I, I would go so far as to say he is actually participating in Satan's work. And Luke wants us to catch this. Um, if, if you've been kind of locked and loaded with Luke throughout this journey. Um, Luke, Luke chapter 4 gives us the, the last time Jesus was in a synagogue and healed somebody. And what was that healing that he gave? He cleansed 
somebody who had an evil spirit. He cast that out. He showed his power over Satan in that moment. But there's something else that happens in Luke chapter 4, and it's, it's re- really instructive. Who is this antagonist of Luke chapter 4 that comes right before the synagogue when Jesus is launching out into his ministry? The antagonist is Satan. He goes out into the wilderness to fight with Satan, and they, and they have this argument uh, that goes back and forth. And Jesus quotes time and time and time again from the Old Testament, particularly from the book of Deuteronomy. And at the very end, Satan and Jesus have this back and forth over how best to interpret the Scripture. They're fighting over that. And Jesus wins the day and walks away victorious over Satan. And what's, what's so fascinating to me is what this really comes down to is the synagogue leader in, in, uh, chap- in verse 14 is arguing about the six days you shall work. And that is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus' response about how, how they handle the animals is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 14. He's saying, you're missing the picture. They are arguing over the interpretation of Deuteronomy. Why is that significant? Because that is the same dynamic that's happening between Satan and Jesus back in Luke chapter 4. So, Luke is actually saying something a little bit more challenging, a little more pressing. He's saying this is actually a cosmic duel of the fates. Enter Star Wars. Um, <clears throat> I try to work one of those references in every week. Um, but uh, so, so this, this is the cosmic battle that's happening here. And this is, this is what the real fight is. The, the fight isn't just some kind of underdog, Cinderella, 16th seed beating the first seed kind of story. What this is, is a story of good and evil played on, on a grand scale. It's a, it's a story of two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. It's the story of two princes, the prince of peace versus the prince of the power of the air. And they're fighting it out for the control of the world and for the control of your souls. And that's what Jesus says is at stake here. In this battle, Jesus shows us how the kingdom wins. Is Jesus going to be victorious? And surely it would be through the leaders of the synagogue and through the big shots of this earth. And Jesus says, no, that is not how my victory comes about. It comes about through the people who feel small, the people who feel insignificant, overlooked, powerless. That's where the victory comes. And he tells that story of this mustard seed. It doesn't turn into the expected bush that, that a, a mustard seed is going to grow into. It turns into a mighty tree where all the nations will one day gather. He tells the story of this little dusting of leaven that goes into this flower, and it's enough to feed an entire village, not just a family, but a village. And Jesus tells these extraordinary stories because he says, that is how my kingdom wins. It doesn't win through the big expected things. It wins through the little ones. And that's why Zechariah, when he's, when he's reminding the people about the day of small things, he says this, this statement that is commonly repeated. Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. The, the, the battle for the kingdom, Jesus doesn't give us an illustration of swords and um, knights and shining armor or anything. He gives us two plain examples of a mustard seed and a, and a woman baking bread. And he says, that's how my kingdom is going to win. That's the weapons of my warfare. And so this morning, you come in here and you, you feel discouraged by insignificance. Insignificance in your own life, insignificance in your family, your work, your ministry, maybe even this church. And you're saying, this just feels like a little bit of nothing. Can I encourage you to come to Jesus, to rest in His mercy and in His power? Because our unexpected Lord takes the insignificant things of this earth, the small things, and does mighty things with them. If you come in here and you're enamored by significance, you want to become something, you're you're looking to the the great things, the big things of this life, the big stage, can I orient your heart and say, there's hope for you? You don't have to follow the pathway of Satan that this leader took. You can as well come to Jesus, come to His mercy, 
find hope and rescue from your feelings of superiority in Him, the ultimate Lord of all things. When I was um, traveling uh, and teaching in, in Peru, out in the jungles, uh, of, uh, there, there's uh, this part in one of the Amazon tributaries where there are just all these pastors that are coming together. They're being trained, equipped, sent out. Um, they'll, they'll go by float planes. They'll go by these little, um, little boats they call pecky peckies because of the sound the motor, motor makes, pecky pecky pecky, as they go up the, the, the streams. And they go and they preach the gospel and they plant churches and they're seeing all kinds of things happening. They have a radio that broadcasts the gospel in 18 different indigenous languages. They all preach in indigenous languages. And, and the gospel's going forth in amazing ways. And I grabbed one of the pe- preachers who's kind of a leader in this movement and it, it kind of after one of the classes, and I said, tell me, like, how the gospel came to you. Like, how did the gospel come into this area? Do you know the story? And th- that story is only a couple generations old. Uh, back in the 40s, a couple of women came to that area uh, and just began telling about Jesus and telling the story about about His love for them and, and, and the, the gospel message, the same gospel that we're telling people about here in the east side of town. And, and just that little bit of faithfulness of these two women who are lost to any history books. I tried Googling them, trying to find their names. It's nowhere to be seen. Two insignificant little ladies who disappeared to the sands of history, but now Thousands of people are coming to Christ. Lives are being changed. Whole towns are being transformed because the kingdom is built using mustard seeds and a little bit of leaven. That's our hope in Jesus. So, you want to see what God can do? Look and follow His eyes. Look at where He is looking at those seemingly insignificant people. Look at the tiny little churches, the hurting women, the hindered minorities, the awkward teenagers, the fumbling gospel presentations, the simple prayers. That's where God's at work, and it's amazing. And to that end, we pray. Lord, we thank You that You use the weak things of this earth to confound the mighty. We thank You that You will use us in Your mission to transform this world, to change lives, to speak hope. Lord, we thank You that You don't use many mighty, that You haven't called many of the big people of this earth. And I pray that You would turn our eyes to You. And if there are those in this room this morning who are wrestling and struggling with Uh, desire for superiority and greatness and bigness in this life, that you would find, help them find their hope in all things in you, the God who doesn't dishonor the small things, who elevates the small things of this earth. Help us to look to you this morning. And to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have a chance to respond to what we've just heard by singing these words, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. I invite you to stand together as we sing.
church. There's just a few things I want to mention uh, that are happening this week in the life of our church. One of those is happening uh, in the next few minutes, actually. We have a new members class. The class is probably an overstatement for what it is. Basically, we want to have a meal with you if you're interested in learning more about our church, kind of who we are, what we do. Um, this is a, a great segue into membership, if that's the path that you want to choose. Um, some of you have signed up for that. If you're here today and you're like, I'd like to know more, um, there is plenty of food, so if you feel like you want to stay, just let one of us know. Uh, we'll be meeting right over there um, in just about 15 or 20 minutes uh, to kind of start that. Again, just a chance for you to get to know more about our church, who we are, 
what we do. Um, we call it our new members class. On Wednesday, we have our first You Know event. Uh, that is Youth Night Out, you know, right? And uh, they're going to be meeting at the home of Tanner and Tori, uh, which is exciting. So mark your calendar for that this Wednesday night. I think it starts at 6. It'll be over around 8. It'll be a good time uh, together. Uh, as you can see, the men's breakfast is happening this week. Again, that's Thursday mornings at 6.30 a.m. at Eggs Up Grill. Um, if you can be there, if, if you're awake at that hour, we'd love to have you there. Um, enjoying breakfast together and just um, spending time with the men of our church. Uh, finally, I'll mention this last screen here. Um, we mentioned this last week. This is called the Church Center app. This is a tool that you can download right on your phone. It'll connect you with our church calendar, with our church events, with signups and different things that you can stay in touch um, as, as we go through the summer and into the fall. Even we'll be rolling this out more. But uh, for now, maybe search for Church Center. Uh, find our church, get it on your phone, and just kind of get used to using it as a way to engage with our church. Um, I'm so excited as well for our pastoral resident, Matt, leading our student ministry, um, and our intern, Lauren. Um, I'm excited next week. Lauren's going to be leading us in worship, um, so we'll look forward to that as well. So uh, lots of things that are taking place, um, and it's an exciting time to be a part of Christ Fellowship Eastside. As always, the gospel goes with you. God bless you as you go.